morning everyone, or whatever time of day you're following this, uh, can I give you a very warm welcome to this service of Christian worship uh, that comes to you from Reynard Way uh, Evangelical Church in Northampton. If you're a member of the church uh, and a regular in our congregation, uh, I'm so glad that you've been able to join, join with us and to continue uh, in fellowship together in this way through these difficult times. Um, if you're not a member of this church and you're just following this service this morning, my name's Andy Bolter, I'm one of the elders of the church here, and I'd like to give you a very warm welcome and encourage you to engage with this and to share in the worship of God with us. We're going to start our service by singing uh, a hymn which is based on Psalm 104, and it's, so it's number 104 in your blue hymn book. Oh, worship the King! All glorious above, O oh, gratefully sing his power and his love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendour and girded with praise. Well, may our praises be part of that praise that surrounds our great God. It's hymn number 104. We're going to sing just the first two and the last two verses. That's verses one and two and five and six. Let's praise God together. Amen. Let's all now come to pray and praise God together. Let, let us all pray. We come all to worship uh, the King. Lord, what a privilege, what a joy it is for us to see and to know our God, the King uh, of creation, uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come, O oh Lord, to worship you and to praise you, to sing of your power and of your love. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace. O oh, Lord, all power uh, belongs to you. And, uh, and Lord, what grace and what goodness and what love uh, flows to us uh, from you. Lord, we see your power and your goodness all around us in creation. Lord, we see the beauty and the wonders uh, that you have made. And we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this amazing world and universe uh, that you have created by the word of your power. We also see here your goodness and your grace 
and your kindness and your care and your provision for us in all that you give to us day by day as our faithful creator. Oh Lord, so we come to you this morning uh, and we worship you as our maker. We are not our own, we're not self-made. Lord, we, you have created us most amazingly, most wonderfully, but you are also our defender. Whatever is happening, oh Lord, uh, whatever threatens our lives, uh, we can come to you as our protector and our defender. But more than that, Lord, you are also our redeemer. Lord, you paid such a high price to redeem us, to save us uh, from the curse of our sinfulness and to forgive us and receive us uh, again to yourself. That's because, Lord, you are our friend. Oh, that to have God, our God, as our friend. And we pray that we might truly be your friends as well and delight to live our lives in your, in your company and in fellowship with you. Lord, so please bless our time of worship and praise. Uh, please help us to pray truly. Please help us to hear your word uh, and to, to have obedient hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing another song now, and it's particularly uh, designed for the children uh, to join in, so I hope you know this one. It's He Made uh, the Stars to Shine. So the words are going to appear on your screen, um, and we're going to sing it through twice, and you may know the actions to do. He made the stars to shine. He made the mountain sign. Well, you know them, I'm sure, better than I do. But let's really enjoy praising our great God, and our, the great maker of all things. He made the stars to shine. Let's turn now to the Word of God, to the Scriptures, and I'm delighted to say that our pastor, Paul Milner, is going to bring the Scripture readings to us this morning, so I'll hand over to Paul now. Good morning. The first of our two Bible readings this morning comes from Colossians and Ephesians. If you're not sure where to find Colossians, look at the contents at the start of the Bible. It's in the New Testament, a small letter. Colossians chapter 3, verse 22. Now, this was written at the time of the Roman Empire, and there was slavery back then. And he's writing to those who are on the lowest rung of the ladder in that society. And they often found themselves serving masters who were not nice people and who treated them badly for their service. Now, thankfully, 2000 years later, that is not the situation we find ourselves in. But there are still helpful lessons and principles we learn from this passage as we work and as we serve and help others. So let's listen to Colossians chapter 3 verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service 
as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for man, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. And then flip uh, back in your Bibles a couple of pages to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 and verse 5. Ephesians 6, verse 5. This is all just one sentence uh, in the original language, but we're going to uh, pause and emphasize uh, to help make it clear. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. This is God's word. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's great to see you and to hear from you again. And uh, we have another of our elders, our leaders now, uh, Pete Skur. Uh, Peter is going to uh, speak to the children. So I hope you're listening, children, to what Uncle Peter has to say to you this morning. Thank you. Hello, boys and girls. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story from Genesis, way back in the Old Testament. There is a reason for this. Abraham was 140 years old when he called one of his chief servants to him. And he said to him, as you can see, go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. The Lord will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. So Abraham gave his servant some instructions. Now then, it was a very, very, very long walk. Abraham's servant was actually going to travel north about 550 miles back to where Abraham had originally come from in a city called Haran. It would have taken probably over three weeks for him to get there. And here's the thing, he had no idea who he was going to find or how he could convince a young woman to travel back and marry a young man she'd never met. And this was a young woman he'd never seen. Abraham had given him one promise, and that was that the angel of the Lord would go before him. Well, as you can see in this third picture, the servant reached a kind of an oasis, I suppose, and he prayed. That was the first thing he did. He must have been quite bewildered. How on earth am I going to do this? I have to find a young woman for Abraham's son, and I've been given this huge responsibility. She's going to be his wife. I have no idea who I'm looking for. So he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show your steadfast love to my master Abraham. And then he kind of um, sought a sign, I suppose, from God. And he just said, let the young woman who offers me a drink and then offers to water my camels 
be the one. Well, he opened his eyes and right there in front of him was this beautiful young woman walking towards him to fill her jar with water. Now would you believe he asked for a drink and she said of course I'll get you a drink and while you drink I'll water your camels just like that. Well it says in the Bible that this man stood silent watching her. No doubt he was absolutely gobsmacked and he realized of course that his prayer that he had prayed only moments before had been answered and prepared to be answered way ahead of time and he said blessed be the Lord the God of my master Abraham who has not forgotten his love and faithfulness towards my master and then basically says the Lord has led me to the house of my master's family. Now of all the houses he could possibly have gone to and all the places he could have ended up for a drink and to water his camels, he'd actually come to the exact place where Rebecca was. Well, this servant, he went to Rebecca's family and he explained everything to them, his instructions for coming, his prayer for trying to find out who the bride-to-be might be and how Rebecca had done the exact thing that he'd prayed for and that she was the one that God had led him to. And Rebecca's brother was Laban and he said, this has come from the Lord. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son. And Rebecca, for her part, agreed that she would go and travel all the way back those 550 miles to meet Isaac to become his wife. Now the story is a really happy one. It's a really big chapter in Genesis. A lot of time is devoted to telling this account. She met Isaac uh, almost as she reached where he lived and uh, they fell in love with each other. It's a lovely romantic finish to the story. Rebecca became Isaac's wife, and the Bible says, and he loved her. But I want us today just to have a short think about that servant. That servant was faithful and more importantly, obedient. And Paul, much, much, much later on in the Bible, says, bond servants or servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters so Abraham had said go find a wife and he went not knowing how he could find a wife but that's what he was going to do and Paul goes on to explain a little bit about how to obey your earthly masters not by way of eye service he says as people pleasers now what that means is, don't just do it when your boss or your master is watching. That's eye service. When you know that they can see what you're doing, that's when you work hard. And nor do it as a people pleaser. So he's just trying to sort of get on with everybody all the time, trying to make sure that everybody likes him. In fact, this servant, he wasn't traveling 550 miles for three weeks or more out and then the same distance again coming back he was away from his own home for over six weeks having knocked up over a thousand miles to go and get Rebecca so he wasn't just doing the job because Abraham was watching him was he because Abraham wasn't there and he wasn't doing it just to please people who would think he was such a nice decent chap or anything like that he wasn't doing it for a pay rise. He wasn't doing it for a promotion. He wasn't doing it so that he could look good. He was doing it because he loved Abraham, his master, and he loved the God of Abraham, his master. He believed in him. Paul goes on to say, 
work instead, I suppose, with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, and whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord, and not for men. In other words, work as though it is God you are working for. Work because God is watching. And this faithful servant of Abraham's, we don't know his name, but that's exactly what he did. He did his job, even though Abraham wasn't able to see him, but because God could see him. Now, how does that apply to you? Well, maybe around at home and at school. Do you only walk down the corridor when a teacher's coming by and then run the other times? Do you only pick out your reading book when the teacher's looking at you and not the other times? Are you quiet in class if the teacher has to speak to their colleague next door or do you immediately start talking when they leave the room? Simple little ideas, aren't they? But these things matter. Do you do it only because you're being watched and you want to please people when you're being watched? Or do you do it because you know that God is watching and therefore he sees you all the time? Now we're all servants of somebody, aren't we? We're all, we all have people who are over us. And that's what this passage is getting at. It wouldn't matter whether you were the head teacher of the school. There is still somebody above you who you are in service to, who you are working for. And so we all have to think like this, not just people who are servants, but whenever we work for anybody. And it's really important. God says, do it like this and know that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. God will reward us and praise us for working as though we are always working for him. Well, let's all pray together, shall we? Our Lord and Father in heaven, we thank you for the example of Abraham's servant, a man who sought the best for his master, a man who wanted to glorify his master and had clearly been persuaded that the very God yourself that his master served was the, going to be the God for him. Help us, Father, to consider that our school life and home life and work life are not really separate from our Christian life. And Lord, that you see us and you hear us. And so as we go about our ordinary days, we ought to be considering that you ultimately are watching what we do, that you know our heart towards the people we serve. Help us, Lord, most of all, not only to serve others right, but to serve you correctly as well. We ask this in your name. Amen. Now it's time to share some news items uh, with you and some information so that we can be keeping in touch and keeping in fellowship together. And the first thing, the first item of news is that God is at work. People around this country, people around the world are coming to know the Lord Jesus at this time. God is a saving God and he's doing his saving work. God is at work humbling the proud and raising up those who are humble. And we can thank him for this. And sometimes we get a, a hint of it. I spoke to a friend in Devon this week and he told me that uh, before the lockdown, they had 15 people coming to their midweek prayer meeting. Uh, they're now Zooming in midweek and there are 48 people now in attendance. He spoke to a friend this week uh, who runs a Christian uh, bookshop and he, told, he was informed that the demand for Bibles had gone up by 50% uh, since the lockdown. So God uh, is at work. God's people are praying. There's a lot of prayer being made 
the management team and uh, uh, the executive of Centre Ministries and the trustees, that's Christian Conference Centre work, set aside Thursday of this week for, for prayer. Um, and many of the Lord's people are setting aside times of special prayer. But also prayer goes on uh, day by day. God's people are praying. We're praying for everyone who is affected uh, and continues to be affected by the whole situation that is going on in our world and, and in our country. And we, we are praying for God's work. As well as praying, we're also finding new ways of sharing the love of Jesus. Uh, the old ways uh, can't happen at the present time. But there are lots of new and imaginative ways, simple ways, that anybody can take up, pick up the phone and, and call somebody. Just write a little message out and pop it in the post to somebody. Loads of ways and practical ways as well, uh, baking something and delivering it to somebody's house. And so we thank, thank God. As far as the church is concerned, there are two things mainly going on. That is what you're seeing now, the ministry of God's word and worship, and also fellowship. Next week we'll be uh, thinking about the gift, gift of the Holy Spirit as we celebrate Pentecost together next Sunday morning. Um, and then in the evening we're continuing to go through our series on letters from lockdown. And Sam will be bringing uh, the latest of these uh, messages this evening. Can I just thank you uh, all of the church members and friends who've continued to donate gifts to the church for the work of the uh, ministry of the church during this period. We're obviously not taking up cash collections in the church at the moment, but so many of you have put money into the church's bank account, uh, and that, that's really appreciated. I'm just going to ask God put, to bless that, uh, that giving now as we pray together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for uh, the, the grace of, of giving. Uh, Lord, you have given so much to us. We have freely received from your hand. And so we're encouraged to freely give. Thank you that we're able to carry on giving to support the work and ministry of the church and the outreach missions that are supported uh, through the church as well. And we pray for your blessing, Lord, upon our gifts, that you would use them to your praise and glory. Amen. Our second Bible reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. You'll find this right towards the end of your Bibles. Uh, find the book of Revelation at the back. Work forward through the small letters of John and you'll come to Peter. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, picking up the same themes that we heard from Colossians and Ephesians. So verse 18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer 
of your souls. Amen. So now we come to our prayer time and we're going to share some prayers together and come to our Father. Uh, I'd like us to focus some prayer on the mission to, to uh, the open air mission uh, this morning. Um, uh, uh, that that uh, God will bless this period of time to, to that work uh, uh, as well. And we're also going to focus our prayers on, on people who are suffering from mental illness, which for many people is, uh, is, is exacerbated uh, due to the circumstances of this present time. So let's come to our Lord and Father in prayer. Oh Lord, we thank you uh, that you have entrusted the work of sharing the good news of your grace and of your love and of your salvation to human beings. We thank you for the gifts and the callings that you have given to particular people. And we especially thank you for uh, the work of those who, who bring the message of hope and of salvation, the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, to people on the streets of our, of our country through the work of the Open Air Mission. And Lord, as they are prevented from doing that at the present time, uh, we pray for them that they would make good use of this period, perhaps to prepare new messages, and also to pray uh, for uh, the people that they would normally preach to. We thank you for Andy Little and for Paul Linnell, who work for the Open Air Mission in this part of the world and uh, we pray for them in particular Lord that you will please bless and encourage them and that they might be ready when the opportunity arises again to go out with the gospel. We thank you that you are at work Lord uh, through the word going out over the internet and in, on other platforms and we pray O oh Lord that you will continue your work that you would do what you can do that what we can't do. Uh, and encourage and bless and help people through all the ministry that goes out. Father, we especially pray for people who, who live with uh, mental illness. Uh, perhaps uh, all their lives they've been uh, afflicted by it. Lord, it can be young people and older people. And Lord, at this time, uh, when their normal routines are upset, the routines that help them so much to keep going, uh, Lord, at this time, uh, when their, their, their mental illness, Lord, uh, returns, Lord, upon them, when those voices that they hear uh, and those dark clouds of depression uh, come in, oh, Lord, we pray uh, that you would have mercy. Oh, Lord, we pray that they would... Uh, that, that, that they would find the help that they, they need um, and Lord they will be kept uh, from self-harming and kept from uh, taking their own lives. Oh Lord please help those who minister to uh, folks with mental illness that they will be given sensitivity uh, and wisdom and Lord that you would even work through uh, this difficult condition uh, to, for, for your good. We particularly pray for those, Lord, some of our, our number who suffer from, from dementia um, and Lord, their, their minds just don't work like they used to and that they have some sense of that um, and Lord, it's so difficult uh, to live with, to cope with that. And so we pray, Lord, once again for, for your help and for your grace to be given to people in these circumstances. Lord, we know that uh, many people are affected in many different ways by the present circumstances, but we thank you that we can bring them all to you. Lord, for those who are facing financial difficulty, we can look to you and pray to you uh, for your provision for them, that you would just provide for what they need. Help us to be sensitive and to see where we might be able to help as well. And Lord, for people who are just stretched at the moment, who are very busy actually at the present time and tired, uh, who are working very hard, uh, we pray for them. 
Oh Lord, please refresh them, please help them, uh, please relieve their, their busyness. Um, and Lord, for those who are um, uh, just very quiet at the present time, those who are, uh, are on their own and have been on their own for a long time now, Lord, um, we do pray, oh Lord, that they would have meaningful contact with other people, that we, that we would be able to, to keep in touch with each other and to be a, a source of help and encouragement to, to one another. Father, we pray for the nations of this world. In all of the struggles and turmoils, Lord, there are many things going on apart from the coronavirus, and we, we pray, O oh Lord, for this, this world in all of its troubles. O oh Lord, we pray that the gospel of peace, that the kingdom of Christ might spread and grow and even, Lord, as you use these opportunities uh, to, 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 to make people stop and think, uh, oh Lord, we pray that many, many people will turn to our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that one day, Lord, you will rule over all the nations of this world, the kingdoms of this world, um, and your kingdom will come. Uh, and we long for that day, Lord, when you will reign as king over all forever and ever. And we thank you now, Lord, that even as we pray, uh, that uh, through simply planting the seed of your word, um, Lord, your kingdom is coming and growing uh, in this world. And we pray, O oh Lord, that many people will be blessed and brought into the kingdom of Christ at this time for your praise and glory. Amen. Let's now sing our, our next hymn. It, it's number 433 uh, in the praise hymn book. Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a saviour. Number 433.
The theme of our message this morning is making the most of most of your life. My first question to you is, what do you spend the most time doing? Uh, For some of you, it may be sleeping. For most of us, it's probably sleeping. Uh, For some of you, uh, it may well be working. Uh, In fact, next to sleeping, I guess working Our working lives are are the biggest part of the lives of each one of us. We spend most of our time, certainly our waking time, working. For some of us that's at school or college or university. For some people it's at the shop or the office or at home. For others it's the hospital, the surgery, the care home. For some of you it's a workshop or a factory or a warehouse. Uh, For some it's working in a a salon, well not in the moment, Um, or or a cafe, well not now, Uh, or restaurant for that matter. Some of you work on a farm, some of you work in stables, some of you work in studios and fitness centres. For some people you, you, you work in a park or a museum or a library. Some people your place of work is a van or a lorry or a refuse truck. For some people, normally it's a hotel or a nursery for children or a garden centre. Wherever it is, most of us spend most of our time at work. And most of us actually are workers and not bosses. Some of us are self-employed as well. But whether we're a worker or a boss or self-employed, we're all serving our clients uh, and our customers. Um, and the public or our family. So we're all serving somebody. In that sense, we're all servants, working away for most of our lives. The question is, how can we make the most of most of our lives? And the first answer to that question is to give our lives to Jesus Christ. It is in that way that we will make the most of our lives. A Christian is somebody who has received Jesus as Lord, who is no longer uh, the Lord of their own lives, but they've given every part of themselves to him uh, to be their Lord and their master. So your life is no longer Uh, It now belongs to him. It's no longer controlled by dark desires uh, and by the forces of darkness that oppose God. No, Jesus now uh, is your saviour. He has forgiven all of your sin. Uh, He's redeemed you. He paid the price to do that. Uh, And he's given you a new power in your life, the grace and power of the Holy Spirit to live a life that is good and pleasing to him. But he's also your Lord. You are now in his kingdom. He is your king. And so he he, he reigns, he is to reign over your heart and over your life. And to fill you, and for your heart and life to be controlled by his love, by his peace, and by his word. And so as a Christian, someone who's given their life to Jesus Christ, he is now the Lord and the master of every part uh, of your life. You serve him and he is the one who can make the most of your life and of your working life. Or is he? Have you yet come to that moment where you have given your heart and your life to him. I mentioned earlier that uh, many people are turning to the Lord at this particular time. God is at work. This is a time of opportunity, a time when you have the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord, to come to him, to give your life to him, to ask him to forgive you, confessing, admitting your sins and against him, 
and trusting in him to forgive you, to take your sin away, and then to come and live in your life as the Lord of your life, and then to help you, whatever part of your life it, it is, to, to make the most uh, of it. So how does Jesus help us to make the most of our working lives? Well, the passages that Paul read to us earlier speak of three ways in which Jesus helps us to make the most of our working life. By being the kind of workers uh, that will be the most fulfilled and the most uh, um, engaged uh, with their work. And these three things are uh, by being honest, by being respectful, uh, and by being good workers. So a, a Christian worker is, a, is an honest worker, is a respectful worker, and is a good worker. And we're going to have a look at those three things from the, the Bible passage that we read. You might like to have your, your, your Bibles open at Colossians 3, verse 22 and onwards. And perhaps have your finger in Ephesians chapter 6 as well, and maybe in 1 Peter chapter 2, depending on how many fingers you've got spare at the moment. First of all then, a Christian worker is an honest worker. Look at uh, Colossians 3 and verse 23. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service, as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. An honest worker is faithful, is dependable, is reliable, is trustworthy. Obeying your master in everything. Your master, your boss, can depend upon you expect you to honestly and faithfully, reliably, fulfil the work uh, that he set you, you to do. Not as, not with eye service. Now Peter has something to say about this in his talk and I totally agree with everything he said. What happens when the teacher goes out of the room? What happens when the boss is out a, on an appointment. We know very well what happens. It happens everywhere. Everywhere is much the same. It's a universal thing. The teacher isn't there, the boss isn't there. Everybody just relaxes a little bit, takes it easy uh, and slows down and maybe even stops working for a while. And people have actually got this off to a fine art. They can hear the teacher's footsteps coming down the corridor, <laughs> quick shop shuffle, back to work. They can see the boss's car pulling into the car park. And it's a universal, it's a universal thing, wherever you go. Now Paul came up with a new word, he coined a new word to describe this, and he called it eye service. Everyone does it, well, everyone that is except for that annoying Christian worker she carries on with her work just the same because she is honest, faithful, dependable and reliable. Not just offering eye service to her boss. But also Christian workers are not people pleasers. You know what people pleasers are, don't you? People who cosy up to the teacher or to their boss. People who are desperate for their favour uh, and uh, for their approval. Now such people are not honestly working for their masters, but they're really serving themselves, wanting to ingratiate themselves and promote themselves uh, to their teachers so they might get some reward, or to their bosses so they might get some favour or promotion. They're really serving themselves and their own ambition. And these things are very telling, aren't they? I service, men pleasers. We're all, I guess, to some extent, guilty of these things. 
And we need to admit that at times we've let ourselves down and we've let our Lord down in the way that we've gone about our work. And we need to ask for his forgiveness and for his help to be truly honest, faithful and reliable workers, people who work with integrity and with sincerity. So a Christian worker is an honest worker. A Christian worker is a respectful worker. We see that in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. And then in Colossians 3 and verse 23, work with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. 1 Timothy 6 verse 1, we haven't uh, read this or looked at this previously, but there it is, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 1. Regard your masters as worthy of all honour. And then in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, uh, Paul read earlier, be subject to them with all respect. How many people uh, today diss their teachers or their bosses? So many of them do it, it's such a regular thing. Except for that annoying Christian again. He has a healthy respect for authority. He may call his boss madam, or almost certainly will treat her with due respect and honour. He will not resent or begrudge her authority, but he will accept it and respect it and submit to it and obey it. So annoying, isn't it, when there are people like that uh, around uh, in, in the workplace. But the reason he does that is, of course, because he respects, he does it out of fear of the Lord. He respects the ultimate authority of his Lord, Jesus Christ. The Christian worker is honest. The Christian worker is respectful. But then thirdly, and finally, uh, the Christian worker is a good worker. Have a look again at the scriptures we've been following. See there in, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily. Put your heart and soul into it, into your work. Ephesians 6 and verse 7. Render service with a good will, with a willing heart, with a, a desire to do your work as well as you can do it. And then in Titus, again not seen this before, Titus 2 and verse 10, showing all good faith. Work heartily, work with a good will, and show all good faith. Christian worker puts her heart and soul into her work. She is diligent and conscientious and industrious. She's not easily distracted, but focused and attentive uh, to her work. And she works with a good will, with a genuine desire to do her best, to do a good job for her boss, for her customer, for her client. Showing all good faith, justifying the trust that has been placed in her. Because, as, as workers, we are entrusted with responsibility. The responsibility of, of doing a job, the responsibility for, uh, for what we are engaged to do. And often that's quite a, a lot of responsibility uh, that we are given. And so we should justify the trust that has been placed uh, in us. So there it is. It's a wonderful picture, isn't it, uh, that we see of this Christian uh, worker. Outstanding, honest, respectful, and just a good worker. But how, how can we do this? Uh, how can we make the most 
of most of our lives in this way? Well, this is where we come to the really exciting part of the message. Because there is something that makes all the difference to our working life. Whatever time of the day it is, whatever kind of work we're doing, whatever our boss might be like, the Christian worker, we're told in uh, Colossians 3 and verse 24, there it is, is serving who? You are serving the Lord Christ. In verse 23 it says, whatever you do, work for the Lord. And in Ephesians 6 and verse 5, obey your earthly masters as you would obey Christ. Verse 7, rendering service as to the Lord and not to man. So this attitude that I'm doing it for my Lord Jesus Christ, I'm serving him in my work, this motive of doing it for him changes work completely. This is the elixir, the potion that turns drudgery into delight. This is the tincture, the colouring, that turns the grey of tedious work into the blue and the, and the colours of joyful service. When we do our work for his sake, for him, for his sake, our Lord and our God. Listen to George Herbert's wonderful poem. Teach me, my God and King, in all things thee to see. And what I do in everything, to do it as for thee. All may of thee partake, nothing can be so mean. God is God isn't excluded from jobs and that we do because they're oh they're so mean and, and ordinary and that God wouldn't want to be involved. No. All of thee may partake. Nothing can be so mean, which with this tincture, with this colouring, for thy sake, will not grow bright and clean. It transforms. You're washing the pots, but you're conscious of the Lord's presence with you. There's a song in your heart. You're doing it for him. And it just changes everything. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine who sweeps a room as for thy laws makes that the sweeping of the room and the action the way he does it fine great good different this is the famous stone that turneth all to gold for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be sold this is what changes everything when we do it for him consciously and even more than that when we do it with a conscious sense of his presence uh, with us but who is this lord why is it that he does change everything in this way what has he done for us? Well, Paul read towards the end of 1 Peter chapter 2 these wonderful words. Let's look at them again. You'll find them in verse 24 of 1 Peter chapter 2. He, this is our Lord, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross that we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Such a loving master, such love, that he would take our vileness, 
our wrongdoings, our sins upon himself in his own pure and holy body uh, and, and that he would suffer uh, the punishment uh, that is due, the punishment of death, of the wrath of God that is due for our sin upon himself, such love, so that he might save us from our sins, so that because he died, we might die to sin now, that sin will no longer be the controlling force in our lives, and that we might live to him, live to righteousness, that he will be our Lord and the controlling force of our lives. And so to serve one who has so served us is our response of pleasure and delight. So my life of joyful service is a, is a response to his life of love and his death for me. It is an expression of the wonderful change that he has made in my life. By his death I have died to sin and I now live to righteousness, to live a different life, to work in a different way, to work for a different master. And by his wounds, I who was broken am healed. My whole life is now an offering of praise to him and thanks to him. Well might I sing, fill thou my life, fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part, including all of my work, with praise, that my whole being, all of me, may proclaim your being, may reflect who you are and what you are like and your ways. Do you know, perhaps the most annoying thing about a Christian worker is the way they go around singing all the time and they're so cheerful and so, so joyful. They always seem to have a, a song on their lips and they're always humming some, some cheerful tune or other. Yeah, it is annoying, but perhaps it's a blessing as well. Perhaps it's great, actually, to have those annoying Christians about. Great to have people who are honest and dependable. Great to have people who are respectful, who work well, and who are glad and cheerful uh, as they go around about their work all to the praise and glory of our Lord and Saviour. As we close this morning, there are two what-ifs that we just need to finally answer, quite briefly. The first one is, what if I am mistreated, misused as a worker? Now, of course, in those days, slaves were often mistreated badly. And today, workers are often exploited, and those who we serve, if we're civil servants or even doctors and nurses, those that we serve and look after, abuse us. And we suffer abuse for doing a good job. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 18, it says this, if you've got a finger in there, 1 Peter 2, 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the unjust, to those who mistreat you, who treat you harshly. This, Peter says, to act in this way is a gracious thing, he says. This is a gracious thing if we're subject to those who, who mistreat us. To endure mistreatment and exploitation, exploitation and abuse, to endure that, to suffer when you are doing good for no other reason. This is a gracious thing in the eyes of God. Not to be angry 
or to mutter threats or curses, not to abuse them back uh, to their face. This is the difference that grace makes. The grace that makes an angry person as gentle as a lamb or as the lamb. See, this grace is seen in the life of Jesus Christ. Peter reminds us in verse 21 that Jesus committed no sin, neither was there any deceit found in his mouth. That can't be said about it, of course. Yet, he suffered abuse. He was spat on. He was mistreated. But we see in verse 23, when he was reviled, he did not revile back again in return. And when he, when he suffered in this way, he did not threaten. He knew, as we read in Colossians 3 verse 25, that the wrongdoer, the person who does these things, will be paid back one day for the wrong that he has done. So why curse somebody who is going to be judged by God? Rather, pity that person. And when you suffer, when you suffer at their hand, commit your cause to the one who will judge justly and fairly. And so follow in the steps of Jesus. Can't go far wrong if you do that. That's what Peter says here. Follow in his steps. So let me see thy footmarks and in them plant my own. Well, what if, what if we're misused? Well, endure. That's a gracious thing in the sight of God. Commit your way to the Lord who judges fairly. What if we're not rewarded for our work? We, we earlier had the story of uh, um, Abraham's servant and how he went off and found a, a wife for Isaac. And I'm sure that he was very satisfied and very well rewarded for his effort. But also a bit further on in the book of Genesis, you come to the story of Joseph. Remember that he was sold into slavery and uh, he worked really hard for his master Potiphar. He was an honest, respectful uh, servant, a, a, a good worker, and he was recognised for that. So what reward did he get for it? Well, his master believed that his wife's, his wife's lies and he threw Joseph into prison. That's all the reward he got for those years of faithful service, a prison cell. God, of course, did reward him richly later in his life. Colossians 3 verse 24 reminds us that if you are working, if you are working for the Lord Christ, from him, from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. He will reward you fully, way beyond fully, uh, for your work and service for him. Even though you've only been able to do it by his grace. Now, if you were a slave in those days, you did not have an inheritance. You worked harder than any of the children, uh, maybe more than twice as hard as the son of the family. But he gets the inheritance. You get nothing. But if you are serving Christ, even if you are a lowly servant, or even a slave, if you are serving Christ, you are a son in his house and you will receive his inheritance. The inheritance that he died to bequeath to you. You will receive the inheritance of the Lord. And if you serve him, the Lord Christ, day by day, in most of your life, faithfully, one day he will say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And great will be your reward in heaven. 
May the Lord bless his word uh, to each one of us this morning. Let's pray uh, together before we sing our, our last hymn. Let, let's all pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for your very clear teaching to us this morning on what a Christian worker looks like. And these are, Lord, truly commendable and good things that nobody could criticise. Uh, we recognise, Lord, that these things can only be true of us, really, if we uh, have you as our Lord and Master, the one who has changed us um, from the inside. Uh, and so we pray, Lord, that first of all, if anybody has been listening to this message this morning, and the Lord Jesus Christ is not yet their Lord and Saviour, O oh Lord, that even now, even in this time, they will bow, get on their knees and, uh, and ask you, Lord, to come into their life and to be their, their Lord and Saviour. And then to be baptised, Lord, on, to show their love and their faith in you when they can. <laughs> and Lord, we also pray for each of us that, that more and more, Lord, we might be focused on, uh, on, on serving you in our day-to-day -day lives, not just having you as the, the Lord of what we do in the church, but the Lord of what we do in all of our lives, in all our daily service, uh, that we might do it for you. And you would please help us by your grace uh, to serve you well. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to sing our last hymn now. It's number 859 in your uh, praise hymn book, if you're following in the book. Jesus, Master, whose I am, purchased, yours alone to be. It's a hymn you may not be that familiar with, but hopefully over the four verses you'll pick up the tune and at least be able to follow the words as well. 859, Jesus Master, whose I am. Let's all close in prayer. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forever. Amen.